investing short term funds by short term funds we refer to funds that are not necessarily needed in a company's daily transactions on the previous slide we were talking about funds that were needed for daily transactions and we called those funds cash practically speaking that would be money that sits in the current account of a company short term working capital portfolios consist of securities that are highly liquid less risky and shorter in maturity than other types of investment portfolios generally working capital portfolios consist of short term government securities and short term bank and corporate obligations you can think of these securities as securities that can be converted into cash within 2 or 3 days examples of short term securities or short term investments are given in example 7 but in most countries the popular short term investment would be government t bills you need to be able to calculate the yield on short term investments if you are running a corporate finance function at a company then you will be making short term investments and you need to understand the yields or the returns that you are getting this material should look familiar because we covered this in quantitative methods let's say that you want to invest in a us t bill and a 90 day 100000 dollar t bill is purchased at a discount rate of 4% you need to calculate the money market yield and the bond equivalent yield again these terms should look familiar what does the discount rate of 4% mean does this mean that you are actually getting a return of 4% and if you remember correctly the return that you are getting is not 4% because the discount yield or a discount rate refers to a discount relative to face value so we can actually use this formula to come up with how much you are paying for the security and then based on how much you are paying for the security you can calculate the money market yield and the bond equivalent yield so let's do the calculation the face value or the par value is 100000 100000 for simplicity i'll just work in thousands 100 minus the price that you pay this is the discount divided by the face value which is 100 times 360 over t t is the time remaining to maturity for a 90 day t bill that would be 90 this is equal to 4% or 0.04 the 100 minus p represents the discount and if you do the math you should get discount equal to 1000 which means that the price that you are paying is equal to 99000 you can now use the price 99000 to come up with the money market yield the money market yield is the par value which is given by f or the face value minus p which is 99 so we have 1000 divided by the price 99000 multiplied by 360 over t t is 90 days and what you get over here is 0.0404 which is 4.04% notice that the money market yield is a little bit higher than the discount basis yield of 4% then we calculate the bond equivalent yield using this formula the discount which is 1 divided by 99 into 365 over 90 because we are using 365 days rather than 360 days this number now is going to be a little bit larger here i want to point out that the formula given here for bond equivalent yield is different from the formula that we saw in quantitative methods and it is different from the formula that we'll see later in fixed income in quant and fixed income bond equivalent yield is given as two times the semi annual yield this is a little bit confusing but what i would say is if you get a question on bond equivalent yield in the corporate finance section of your exam then use this formula 
otherwise use the formula that we have seen in quant and the formula that you will see in fixed income. If you have trouble memorizing too many formulas, then memorize this one because this formula is more accurate. Strategies for managing short-term investments and how do you evaluate your performance. The objective of short-term investments is to earn a reasonable return while taking on limited credit risk and limited liquidity risk. Credit risk is the risk that the counterparty will default in some form and this is a topic that we'll see in a lot of detail in fixed income. But it's fairly obvious that when a company is making short-term investments, it wants to be able to liquidate very fast. And obviously, a company does not want to take the risk that the counterparty will default. That's why generally short-term funds are invested in government securities or securities of companies that have a very good credit rating. Liquidity risk refers to the risk of not being able to convert your investment into cash at market value. And again, given that a company wants to be able to quickly convert its investment into cash, generally speaking, companies will not want to take on liquidity risk. Companies should create a investment policy statement or a IPS. This statement should clearly identify the purpose or the objective, the authorities, so who has the authority to invest how much, what are the limitations and restrictions in terms of the sorts of investments that can be made, and so on. This is a fairly elaborate topic, and we will cover it in more detail when we do portfolio management. My suggestion to you is read Exhibit 9 and Example 3, which will give you a good sense for dealing with uh, IPS in this context. Short-term strategies can be passive or active. Passive strategies focus on rules. There might be a rule which says that short-term investments can only be made in government securities, or more specifically, investments can only be made in three-month T-bills and six-month T-bills. Generally, the rules focus on safety and liquidity. Active strategies are more aggressive and require constant monitoring. There are different subtypes of active strategies which include matching, mismatching and laddering. Very simplistically, with matching, we are trying to identify our cash needs and making investments based on our cash needs and essentially matching the inflow of cash with outflow. In other words, if a company knows that it will need a certain amount of cash after 90 days, then it would make sense to invest in a 90-day T-bill now so that when the T-bill matures in 90 days, the cash can be used to pay off the obligation. That is a very simple example. Finally, how do we evaluate short-term funds management? Say you are an analyst and you want to evaluate how well the corporate finance function of a given company is doing and more specifically, you want to evaluate their short-term funds management. Here is what you need to do. You need to look at the various investments that are being made and then compute the weighted average of the investments in terms of the yield that you use, you should use the bond equivalent yields because that is how most investments are quoted. Important point is to be consistent. So if a company makes three investments, A, B and C, for each of those investments, you need to know what is the bond equivalent yield. So say the bond equivalent yield is 5%, 6% and 7%. You then take a weighted average of the three. If simplistically these three are all equally weighted, then you simply have a weighted average of six. Compare this yield with a benchmark rate. We don't need to get into too much detail here, but just imagine that there is a benchmark rate which is made available to you, which is a standard rate or a short-term rate you need to then compare the 6% with a short-term benchmark rate. 
from an exam perspective, that short term benchmark rate will be given to you. In the real world, you will need to figure out what the appropriate benchmark rate is. Take a look at exhibit 10 in the curriculum. This is a short exhibit which comes up with a weighted average rate and the benchmark rate is given. The weighted average is then simply compared with the benchmark. If the weighted average rate is below the benchmark rate, that means that short term funds are not being managed very well. Managing accounts receivables. There are three primary activities in accounts receivable management. First is establishing credit terms, granting credit to various customers and then processing transactions. You need to understand that a company can offer multiple credit terms. Examples of credit terms would be 210 net 45. This means that a company is saying that customers need to pay back within 45 days, but the customer will get a 2% credit, but the customer will get a 2% discount if he pays within 10 days. Now, tell me what 110 net 30 means. This means that if a customer pays within 10 days, he will get a 1% discount, but the customer is supposed to pay the entire amount within 30 days. You can also have payment terms such as cash on delivery or cash before delivery. So there are a lot of credit terms that can be defined. A company needs to establish which customer has which credit terms. Obviously, customers that have a good credit record or are very credit worthy can get more relaxed credit terms, whereas a customer who does not have good credit would have to essentially pay cash on delivery. Or we could say that in that case, the company would offer customers very tight credit terms. The second primary activity is monitoring the credit balances. And finally, we need to measure the performance of our credit function. As you might imagine, there is a trade off between strict credit terms and ability to make sales. If a company has very strict credit terms relative to competitors, then a company will lose sales because customers would rather go to your competitor who offers easier or looser credit terms. On the other hand, if your credit terms are too lenient, then customers might take advantage of those credit terms, but your bad debt allowance might have to go up. In other words, customers who don't have a strong credit history or customers who don't have a strong financial position will buy goods from you on credit but not be able to pay up on time. You need to understand at a high level how companies manage customer receipts. The curriculum says a lot on this, but this item is not emphasized in the learning objectives. So I'll just give you some high level points. You are a company, your customers make payments. What are the different ways in which they can make payments? Perhaps the best way to make payments is using electronic funds transfer where money is transferred electronically from the customer's account to your company's account. Lockbox, this is another mechanism where customers mail their checks to a post office box and your bank is responsible for picking up the checks from the post office box and depositing in the account. There is a measure called the float factor, which essentially measures check deposits. Float factor is equal to average daily float divided by average daily deposits. The float in this context refers to money that is in transit, money that has left the customer's account and hasn't yet hit your company's account. A high float factor implies that there is a lot of money in transition. How do we evaluate receivables management? From an exam perspective, this is important because you as an analyst will be evaluating among several other things, how well a company manages its receivables. 
There are many ways of measuring accounts receivable performance. Most deal with how effectively outstanding receivables can be converted into cash. In other words, how good is a company at collecting money from its customers? A simple measure which we have talked about earlier is the number of days of receivables. If you recall, we calculated the receivables turnover ratio, which was simply equal to sales or credit sales divided by average receivables. And then we calculated the days of receivables by saying that we take the number of days in a period. If we are taking a one year period, then we have 365 divided by receivables turnover. This is a simple measure and perhaps the measure that is most likely to show up on your exam. But the problem with this measure is that it does not consider the age distribution. You might have a company where you have accounts receivables that are between, let's say, 50% of the receivables are between 30 and 60 days old, and the remaining 50% are greater than 90 days. This is a very simple example of a aging schedule. This simplistic measure does not consider the aging schedule. So let us look at a slightly more sophisticated example where we do consider the age distribution. Here is a example of a age distribution for receivables. Receivables in the month of January that are less than 31 days old or less than 31 days outstanding equals 2000. Between 31 days to 60 days outstanding is 1500 and so on. Obviously, the longer that a receivable is outstanding, the more dangerous it is for a company because the chances of this money being collected are relatively low. We also have the data for February and March. In this table, we have taken the January numbers and expressed them as a percent. The 40% is equal to 2000 divided by this entire amount. If you add up all these numbers, you have 5000. 2000 is 40% of 5000. Similarly, 1500 represents 30% and so on. What we are after is calculating the weighted average collection period for every month. For January, that number is 46.5. And this is how we come up with the number. This information is going to be given to you. For receivables that are less than 31 days outstanding, we are told that on average, the receivables are 15 days outstanding. This number will be given to you if you get a question on the exam. In the 31 to 60 day category, you are given this information that the receivables are on average 45 days old. In the real world, you can think of this information coming from the MIS system of a company. The 40%, 30% numbers were calculated right here for the month of January. You multiply the average collection days, 15 times the weight, 40%, to come up with 6. Do this for each row and then add up all these numbers and you will get 46.5. So 46.5 is the weighted average collection period, which does take into account the age distribution of the receivables. This, in other words, is a more sophisticated measure compared to days of receivables.